Welcome to the Loan Repayment Strategies module on the Revised Pay to Earn or Repay Payment Plan. This is one in a series of educational modules that have been created by the law school for your benefit to help you plan for and manage the repayment of your federal student loans. It's very important that you make informed decisions about how you manage the repayment of your federal student loans. And one of the decisions or choices you're going to have to make in managing repayment is what payment plan to choose. And revised pay to earn or repay is the newest of the income-driven repayment plans. And so it's very important that you understand how does this income-driven repayment plan differ from the other existing income-driven plans. Because it could be that this plan could be a better option for you than the plans that existed prior to its creation. So in this module, we're going to focus on how the revised pay to earn repay payment plan compares to the other income-driven plans. I'd encourage you to check out the education module on the income-driven plans and all, on all the payment plans, two of the other modules in the Loan Repayment Strategy series to learn more about the other repayment plans that are available in repaying your federal student loans. So let's get started. What is repay or revised pay as earn? Well, revised pay as earn is a 10% income-driven repayment plan. And federal student loans are really unique in that they're the only form of credit where your monthly payments can be based on a percentage of your income rather than on the amount you owe. And in the case of revised pay earn, the monthly payments would be based on 10% of your household's annual discretionary income. This plan is available to all direct loan borrowers. So if you have federal direct subsidized or unsubsidized or Stafford loans, if you have direct Grant Plus loans, or if you have a direct consolidation loan, those loans are eligible to be repaid using the revised pay to earn or repay plan. In addition, there are no new borrower requirements, and there's no requirement that you be experiencing a partial financial hardship in order to be able to enter that plan. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what are the new borrower requirements and what is partial financial hardship when we compare this plan to the other plans that might have those requirements. Another important factor to realize is that repay does qualify as an eligible payment plan for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, or PSLF. And if you're planning on working with a government agency or a nonprofit organization in public service and hoping to take advantage of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Benefit, then you'd need to be making payments using a qualifying income-driven repayment plan, and repay does qualify as one of those plans. And this plan became available to all borrowers beginning in mid-December 2015. So, how does repay compare to the other income-driven plans, the plans where your payments are based upon a percentage of your household's annual discretionary income? Well, repay is the newest of the income-driven plans. And in looking at this chart, the plans are listed in reverse chronological order. So the newest income-driven plan is repay or revised pay room. The oldest of the income-driven plans is the one on the bottom of the list, the ICR plan. And ICR stands for Income Contingent Repayment. And that was created back in 1994. In 2007, the income-based repayment plan was created, the IBR plan, and then it was approved upon through Congress, uh, and that's the IBR for New Borrowers plan, and then that was improved upon with payee or pay as you earn, and then finally, revised pay as you earn was created again about uh, in, in December of 2015, so that all borrowers would have access to a 10% income-driven plan. Now, with these plans, your payment is based upon a percentage of your household's annual discretionary income, what's referred to as DISC, or DISC income, either 10%, 15%, or 20%. So what is discretionary income? Well, discretionary income is that portion of your household's annual adjusted gross income that exceeds 150% of the federal poverty guideline for your family size and state of residence. So in essence, what we're doing in using the income-driven plans is we're trying to establish what you can afford to be paying each month based upon your income and your expenses. And we use your adjusted gross income as the income figure. For your expenses, a proxy is used, and that's equal to 150% of the federal poverty guideline for your family size. So in repay, the percentage of your discretionary income that's assessed is 10%. The same as in pay as you earn or payee and IBR for new borrowers. In the original IBR plan, the percentage of income required was 15%, and in the original income-driven plan, ICR or income contingent repayment, 
the uh, assessment was at 20%. So you see that repay gives you the lowest possible percentage contribution from income of any of the plans, the same as in payee and IBR for new borrowers. One thing to notice about repay, payee, and ICR is that there's an asterisk to the right of the name of the plan. And that asterisk is referenced at the bottom of the chart and indicates that only federal direct loans are eligible to be repaid using these three plans. FFEL, Stafford, Grad Plus or Consolidation Loans are not eligible, nor are non-federal federal loans such as the Perkins. But those loans could be consolidated through the Federal Consolidation Program to make them eligible. And an FFEL loan is a Stafford Grad Plus or Consolidation Loan that was borrowed prior to July 1st of 2010 through the Federal Family Education Loan Program, and it was borrowed from a commercial lender, a bank, a credit union, something like that. Direct loans, which have actually been uh, the only source for Stafford, Grad Plus, and consolidation loans uh, since July 1st of 2010, are loans that you've borrowed directly from the federal government through the U.S. Department of Education. And it's only direct loans that are eligible for repay, pay journal, and ICR. But all direct loans, including the unsubsidized and subsidized Stafford loan, the Grad Plus loan, and the consolidation loan, as long as they were originally borrowed through the Department of Education as part of the direct loan program, then they are eligible. Now, the next column in the chart references new borrower. And you don't have to be a new borrower to be able to use repay, but you do have to be a new borrower to use the other two 10% options. And that's an important difference. And we're going to talk more about what that means in a few minutes. For the original IBR plan and ICR, you don't need to be a new borrower. PFH is required in some of the plans, but not in repay. PFH stands for Partial Financial Hardship. And again, in a subsequent slide, we'll explain what a Partial Financial Hardship is, so you can understand how this matters. Because for the other two 10% options, Partial Financial Hardship would be required, as, will, as well as with the original IBR plan. The next to the last column references forgiveness. And this would be a taxable benefit under the current tax code. But on, under all of the income-driven plans, you'll notice from the second bullet down in the footnotes that monthly payments can be less than the accrued interest each month. In other words, negative amortization is permitted. And if you're not paying all the interest that's accruing each month, then your debt is actually getting bigger. And so Congress, in creating these plans, built in a safety net to ensure that eventually the debt would be gone even if you hadn't paid it all back yourself, and that at some point in time, the remaining balance would be forgiven if there still was a balance. In repay, if you only have loans as an undergraduate, then it would be after 20 years. But if you have loans from graduate school or both from undergrad and graduate school, then the forgiveness is after 25 years. Whereas in the other two 10% options, it would have been after just 20 years. In the original IBR plan, the 15% option, it would have been after 25 years. And in the ICR plan, it would be after 25 years. And again, under the current tax code, any amount forgiven would be a taxable benefit. The final column references subsidy. And in the income-driven plans, as I've mentioned, negative amortization is permitted. In other words, it's permitted for your monthly payment to actually be cover, uh, paying less than all the interest that's occurring that month. And under several of these plans, if that's happening, there may be a subsidy. In other words, the government may be paying some of that unpaid interest or some of that negative amortization amount for you. In the case of repay, it would be available on all of your loans, both subsidized and unsubsidized, including the Grand Plus. And there would be no time limit as to how long you'd be eligible for that subsidy. In pay to earn IBR for new borrowers and the original IBR plan, the subsidy is only available on your subsidized Stafford loans, and it's only available for the first three years. There is no subsidy benefit on the unsubsidized Stafford loans or on the Grad Plus loan, and after three years of subsidy on the subsidized loan, there no longer is any subsidy benefit. So you see that repay offers the potential for a greater subsidy benefit than the other income driven plans in situations where negative amortization is occurring. In other words, in situations where your monthly payment each month is not enough to be covering the interest that accrued, accrued on that loan that month. A couple other notes in the footnotes are the payments with the income driven plans are adjusted once every 12 months, up or down, based upon how your household's adjusted gross income and your family size have changed. And I've given you just an explanation of what the definitions are. 
So now let's look at how repay compares to several of these plans. Because in reality, you're likely only going to be choosing between repay, pay to earn, or the original IBR plan. Although there is the IBR for new borrowers, which is one of the 10% options. It is not as beneficial to borrowers as the pay to earn or the repay plan. Although it was the original 10% option, once pay to earn and repay were created, it made the IBR for new borrowers plan obsolete. So we're not really going to talk further about that. And all of the plans, including uh, the, the repay and the IBR plans, give you a monthly payment that would be lower than under the ICR plans in almost all cases. So in almost all cases, the ICR plan, the original income driven plan, is also now essentially unneeded. It's obsolete. So again, we're going to be focusing on comparing repay to the pay insurance plan, the other 10% option that you might want to choose, and the original IBR plan, which would be the only other option you might want to consider if you weren't eligible for pay insurance because you didn't meet the new borrower requirement. So let's now move on and look at comparing repay first to pay to earn, the plan that it basically uh, tried to improve upon. So what are the similar similarities between repay and pay to earn? Well, in both plans, payments are based upon 10% of your household's annual discretionary income, and payments qualify for public service loan forgiveness, or PSLF, and the payments are only available for repaying your federal direct loans, your direct unsubsidized loan, your direct subsidized loans, your direct grad plus loan, and your direct consolidation loan. So what are the differences between repay and pay to earn that would favor choosing pay to earn over repay? Well, in repay, the forgiveness would occur after 25 years, whereas in pay to earn, the forgiveness would have been after 20 years or five years sooner. Now, that's going to be a difference that would matter in 20 years, but that doesn't matter today. And let's suppose you started out in the repay plan, making payments, and you had been making payments on the repay plan for 19 years and 11 months. If you then switch to the pay to earn plan, assuming you were eligible to do so, and you made one more payment, you would then be eligible to have the remaining balance forgiven. Even though you had only been in pay to earn for one month, you had been in a different income driven plan for the other 19 years and 11 months. And those 19 years and 11 months of payments would count as qualifying months towards this forgiveness benefit. So the fact that and repay the forgiveness would occur five years later if you have loans at the gradual level isn't a difference that would matter when you first start out in the plan and you can always switch from one payment plan to another assuming the plan still exists and you're eligible to do so. Another difference is that in repay your spouse's income is always going to count as part of the household's income whereas in pay to earn it's only going to count as part of the household's income if you file a joint tax return. I mentioned that the payment is based in both plans on 10% of your household's annual discretionary income. And I define discretionary income as being that portion of your household's total adjusted gross income that exceeds 150% of the federal poverty guideline for your family size and state of residence. Now, if you are married, your household's adjusted gross income will include both your income and that of your spouse in all of the plans if you file your taxes jointly with your spouse. In pay to earn and the IBR plans, your spouse's income would be excluded under the current rules if you file your taxes separately from your spouse. Now, in filing your taxes separately from your spouse, there is a trade-off in that it may be increasing the amount your household is paying in taxes, so you'd want to evaluate that. But at least for now, if you wanted to file your taxes separately, then you could have a lower monthly payment, assuming your spouse has income, by choosing the pay as you earn plan than if you were in the repay plan, because in repay, that exclusion with regard to your spouse's income if you file separately does not exist. It doesn't matter how you file your taxes in the repay plan, both incomes will be included. But I also think you want to assume that moving forward, it's likely that Congress is going to modify the terms of these plans and they're likely going to eliminate that exclusion because as we see from the most recent of the income driven plans, that exclusion does not exist. So for planning purposes, I think you want to assume for trying to forecast how your payments might change over time, that if you are married or are planning on getting married, that if you're using an income driven plan, you want to sort of be thinking in terms that your monthly payment would be based upon both the income of you and your spouse. But if we are including your spouse's income in the calculation, then any amount of federal student loan debt that is in repayment by your spouse will also get factored into the calculation because obviously if your spouse also has federal student loan debt that's in repayment, then a portion of the household's income 
also has to be going to repay their debt as well. A final difference between repay and pay short that favors pay short that is in repay, the payments are never capped. They do not max out. Whereas in pay as you earn, the payments could cap, get capped, or max out at the standard 10-year payment amount once a partial financial hardship no longer exists. And a partial financial hardship exists when the amount of your monthly payment based upon your income would be equal to a smaller amount than the amount that would have been required if you were using the standard 10-year payment plan. If your monthly payment based upon your income is less than that standard 10-year amount, then you're experiencing a partial financial hardship. And you'd have to be experiencing a partial financial hardship to be eligible to enter the pay as you earn and the IVR plans. Whereas in repay, there is no requirement. Now obviously, once you're in a plan that requires a partial financial hardship, there is the possibility at some point that you'll no longer have a partial financial hardship because in each of the income different plans, as your income increases over time, your monthly payments will be adjusted accordingly. And that adjustment is done on an every 12 month or annual basis. So as your income increases, you could reach a point where your monthly payments based upon a percentage of your income are now larger than the amount you would have been required to pay when you originally entered the plan based upon the standard 10 year payment amount. In that case, you no longer be experiencing a partial financial hardship. And in the pay as you earn and the IBR plans, if that's the case, then your payments now cap out or max out at that standard 10 year amount. It's not that you're removed or kicked out of the plan, it's just that your payments stop increasing. Whereas in repay, the partial financial hardship issue is not an issue. You don't have to have a partial financial hardship to enter the plan, and if you don't have a partial, if it's not defined, then it doesn't cause a capping of the monthly payments. So your monthly payments could increase. Now again, that's not likely going to be an issue for when you first enter repayment because pay as earn wouldn't have even been an option if you didn't have a partial financial hardship. And if at some point you can see that at some point in the near future, your monthly payments are going to reach a point where if you had been on pay as earn, they would have capped out to the standard 10 year amount. Then as long as you switch to the pay as earn plan while you're still experiencing a partial financial hardship, then you'd be able to take advantage of that benefit. So there are also differences between repay and pay as you earn that would actually favor repay. So what are those differences? Well, first of all, there's no new borrower requirements. All direct loan borrowers are eligible to use repay. Whereas in pay as you earn and the IBR for new borrowers, you have to be a new borrower. In the case of pay as you earn, you have to be a new borrower as of October 1st of 2007, which means either you didn't have any federal student loans prior to that date, or if you did, all of those loans were fully repaid before you took out your first new federal loan on or after October 1st of 2007. And if you're not a new borrower, there's nothing you can do to change that. In IBR for new borrowers, you have to be a new borrower as of July 1st of 2014. So once again, you can't have had any loans prior to that date, or if you did, they were fully repaid before that, before you took out the new loan. So for those of you who aren't new borrowers, Page Earn and the IBR for new borrowers, the other two 10% options are not even available to you, and there's nothing you can do to change that fact. Whereas in repay, that isn't a requirement. So now, all borrowers of federal direct loans, regardless of whether they're a new borrower or not, are eligible for at least one of the 10% options. In repay, there's no partial financial hardship requirement. So once again, it's not something that's limiting your ability to choose the plan. And that's beneficial, although if you're not experiencing a partial financial hardship, in other words, if the amount of your monthly payment based upon your income wasn't resulting in a payment that was less than the standard 10-year amount, then I don't know why you would choose an income driven plan. I think strategically, since you have a choice of payment plans, you always want to be using the payment plan that's giving you the most financial flexibility and the most control over how you get to spend your money. Well, that's going to be the plan that's giving you the lowest required monthly payment. Well, if you're not experiencing a partial financial hardship, then the income driven plans are not going to be giving you the lowest monthly payment because the standard 10 year plan would have given you a lower monthly payment by definition. And finally, and what is likely the most important difference, is that in repay, there is the opportunity for increased interest subsidy when negative amortization occurs. And I'm going to explain this in more detail in a subsequent slide. So let's move on. 
Because now we do need to compare repay with the original IBR plan, the 15% option, because some borrowers may not be new borrowers and therefore aren't eligible for pay as you earn. So then the only other option you might want to consider would be the original 15% IBR plan. So what are the differences that would favor IBR uh, as relative to repay? Well, in repay, your spouse's income is always going to be included as part of the household's income when calculating your monthly payment. Whereas in IBR, it's only included currently if you file a joint tax return. If you file your taxes separately from your spouse, then in the IBR plans, your monthly payment would be based only on your income. And 15% of your income alone, if filing separately, may be less than 10% of your combined incomes as a married couple. And if, again, you're looking for the plan that would give you the lowest possible monthly payment, which strategically might be important to you, then it might make sense to file your taxes separately and to choose IBR if it gave you a lower monthly payment, as long as the reduction in your monthly payment which caused you to have to file your taxes separately, didn't simultaneously cause an offsetting increase in your tax liability as a couple that offset and eliminated that benefit. In repay, payments are not capped. They do not max out. Whereas in IBR, again, because it's a plan that requires that you be experiencing a partial financial hardship, the payments are capped or maxed out at the standard 10-year payment amount once that partial financial hardship no longer exists. So once again, if it's, it appears as though your income is increasing to the point where at some point in the near future, your monthly payments, if you were on the 15% IBR plan, would now max out at the standard 10-year amount, then at that point you might want to consider switching from repay, which isn't going to have that cap, to the IBR plan. You would just need to make sure you switch at a point while you still were experiencing a partial financial hardship. Because once your payments based upon your income would now exceed that standard 10-year amount, you would no longer be experiencing a partial financial hardship, so you wouldn't be eligible at that point to switch to the IBR, IBR plan if you wanted to do so. So there's also differences between repay and the 15% IBR plan that would favor choosing repay. First and most obvious is the payments in repay are based upon 10% of the household's annual discretionary income, whereas in the IBR payments, the payments are based upon 15% of the household's annual discretionary income. So with repay, your monthly payments would be one-third less than they would be in the 15% IBR plan. And again, I think strategically, you might want to try to always have the payments that are giving you the most flexibility and therefore are the lowest. There are no new borrower or partial financial hardship requirements. All direct, loans are borrow all direct loan borrowers are eligible to use repay. And finally, as with a difference between repay and page earn, in repay, there's the opportunity for increased interest subsidy when negative amortization occurs. So what is this subsidy benefit that we've talked about in repay? Because uh, uh, repay does offer more potential interest subsidy than page earn or IBR. So what do we mean? Well, the interest subsidy occurs during periods of negative amortization. So what is negative amortization? Well, negative amortization occurs whenever the scheduled monthly loan payment is less than the amount of interest that accrued on that loan that month. And normally when you have debt, that's not allowed under federal credit laws. The only form of debt where negative amortization is even permitted is with federal student loans, and it's only permitted when we're paying federal student loans in cases where you're using the income-driven repayment plans. If you're using the standard, the graduated, or the extended payment plans, the original payment plans that are based upon not your income, but the amount of your debt, then even with those plans, negative amortization isn't permitted. It's only permitted with the income-driven plans because with the income-driven plans, your payment is based upon your ability to repay the debt. And it could be, given the amount of your debt and your income, that you can't even afford to be paying all the interest. And with the income-driven plans, that would actually be permitted. Now, when negative amortization is occurring, that means First of all, you're not even paying all the interest that's accruing each month, and you're not touching the principal, so it causes the outstanding balance of your loan to increase. So that's why the government created, as part of these plans, the possibility that they might subsidize some of that interest. Now, in, with your subsidized loans, and as graduate students, you don't have probably many, if any, direct subsidized loans because graduate students lost the opportunity to borrow subsidized direct student loans back in, I think it was 2010 or 2011, most law students actually only have unsubsidized direct student loans, the unsubsidized Stafford loan and the Grad Plus loan, which is also an unsubsidized loan. 
So for most law students, at least current law students, they don't have subsidized loans. They only have unsubsidized loans. But for subsidized loans, in repay, page run, IBR for new borrowers, and the IBR plan, 100% of that unpaid interest, or 100% of the negative amortization amount, would be subsidized or paid by the federal government during the first three years you were in the plan. But then once you'd been in that plan for three years and you'd received three consecutive years, or 36 months, of subsidy, then only in repay would you continue to get any subsidy, and it would be 50% of the unpaid amount rather than 100%. In pay as you earn, IBR for new borrowers, and the original IBR plan, the subsidy benefit would stop after you'd received 36 months of consecutive, 36 months of subsidy. And in ICR, there is no subsidy benefit at all. So you see that repay gives the opportunity or the potential for a higher and a longer subsidy benefit if you have subsidized direct student loans than the other options. But the bigger issue is the unsubsidized loans. Because with unsubsidized loans, the only payment plan that would offer any subsidy benefit at all if negative amortization is occurring is repay or revised pay sure. And it would be subsidizing 50% of the unpaid amount. So that means, in that case, that your debt is growing only half as fast, and that would be beneficial to you. In the other income-driven plans, payee or pay to earn, IBR for new borrowers, the original IBR plan, and ICR, there is never any subsidy benefit on unsubsidized loans, the unsubsidized Stafford and the Grand Plus loan. So here you see that there's a greater potential subsidy benefit at least during periods of negative amortization, periods when your monthly payment is not large enough to be covering all the interest accruing that month if you choose repay. And that is a benefit that begins in the very first month you're in repayment that negative amortization exists. So that's a benefit that kicks in right away, as far as some of these other differences are not really differences that matter uh, until later in the repayment cycle in terms of what might favor the other plans. And just to give you an example of what that subsidy might be, I did some calculations. And so I used a debt figure of $90,000, and I assumed all of that $90,000 was in the form of direct loans that were unsubsidized, a combination of direct unsubsidized staff loans and direct grant plus loans. I assumed a weighted average interest rate on that debt of 6.1%. I assumed a household AGI of $71,000, I assumed the borrower was single and had no dependents, so the household size was one. They were living in the state of Utah, and I used the 2016 federal poverty guidelines because I used, needed to use those to determine your monthly payment. The estimates were calculated using the repayment estimator that's available from the Department of Education out at studentloans.gov. So with those assumptions, the interest accrued each month would have been $456 until you started reducing the principal balance. And just so that you can know, in using the repayment estimator, if you look at what the initial monthly payment would be under the extended graduated plan, one of the plans that bases your monthly payment on uh, a 25-year amortization schedule, with the extended graduated plan, the initial monthly payment amount is equal to the interest that it's accruing. That's the interest-only amount. So for purposes of comparison, if you wanted to know how much interest was accruing on your student loans using the calculator, you could look at the initial monthly payment under the extended graduated payment option, one of the other payment plans that's available to you, but that bases your monthly payment on the amount of your debt, not your income, to estimate what that interest amount would be. The repay monthly payment based upon an income of $71,000, a household size of one, living in Utah, using the 2016 property guidelines, would have been $443. Well, what is the difference? Is there negative amortization occurring? Well, you subtract the monthly payment under repay from the accrued interest amount, which would be a difference of $13. In this case, there was $13 of interest that was not paid. So the amount of negative amortization would have been $13. In the repay plan, 50% of that unpaid amount would have been paid by the government. It would have been subsidized. So you would have received a subsidy benefit of $6.50. And that's not money you're receiving from government, but it's interest you're never going to have to pay. And that's a tax-free benefit. And over 12 months, the subsidy would have been $78. Now, that may not necessarily be a big amount, but it's more than you would have gotten under the other income-driven plans. So what IDR plan should you choose? Well, I think, again, you want to choose the plan that gives you the lowest monthly payment. So the question becomes, 
Well, which plan is going to give you the lowest multi-payment option? And it's going to depend on your situation. And this flowchart tries to help you figure that out. So what IDR plan offers the lowest monthly payment for borrowers? And in this chart, this flowchart, we're only looking at the monthly payment. We're only looking at what plan would give you the lowest monthly payment. We're not really looking at other factors. Well, if you are a new borrower, in other words, you did not have loans prior to, and again, we're comparing repay with pay as you and IBR, because IBR for new borrowers, which also requires you to be a new borrower, and the ICR plan are really obsolete plans now. So if you are a new borrower, which means you did not have any federal loans prior to October 1st of 2007, then you would be eligible for the pay as you plan. And you would also be eligible for repay because it doesn't have new borrower requirements. So if you're eligible for both, then you have to look at other factors to determine what plan should you choose. Because if you're experiencing negative amortization, if based upon your income and family size, your monthly payment using IBR, using repay and pay your results in negative amortization, in other words, is less than the interest that's accruing on the debt that month, then under repay, you'd be getting a greater subsidy benefit than under pay your You'd have the same monthly payment, but the added benefit you'd be receiving if you chose repay is that you would be giving more of the interest paid by the government. And this is also assuming in this case uh, that we're looking only at you at this point. We're not factoring in whether you're married or not. Now let's suppose you're not a new borrower. You're not eligible for pay short because you did have federal loans prior to October 1st of 2007. Well then we have to look at the issue. Are you single? If you are, then repay is giving you the lowest monthly payment option because it's the only 10% option you're eligible for. If you're married, then the issue is do you file a joint tax return? If you do, then again, repay is going to give you the lowest monthly payment because it's the only 10% option that you're looking at and eligible for because you're a new borrower. On the other hand, if you don't file a tax return and your spouse has income, now again, you need to look at, well, does IBR give you a lower monthly payment? Because if you're filing your taxes separately, it's only going to be looking at what your monthly payment would be based upon your income in IBR. And 15% of, of your income may be a lower monthly payment than 10% of your combined incomes. Because remember, even if you file your taxes separately with repay, your monthly payments would still be based upon your combined incomes. Now, if your spouse has no income, then it's not going to matter because the only income in the household is your income. And so now, 10% of your income alone is still going to give you the lowest monthly payment. So once again, repay would give you the lowest monthly payment. So the only time when repay isn't going to give you the lowest monthly payment is in situations where you're eligible for pay as you earn, and in that case, you have to look at, well, are you married or not? If you're married but filing separately, then repay is going to give you a higher monthly payment than pay as you earn. If you're married filing jointly, then it's going to be the same, and repay may give you more subsidy benefit. If you're not eligible for pay as you earn, the only time IBR might be a better option is, at least in terms of monthly payment, is when your monthly payment based upon your income alone is less than your combined incomes, or when you've reached, in both cases, the point where you're about ready to see a situation where the uh, partial financial hardship would no longer exist, and then you might want to switch to pay as your, to IBR or pay as your, depending upon which you're eligible for. The point is, this flowchart is really designed to help you evaluate which plan and plan should you start with not whether or not over time you might want to change plans. In discussing the repay plan, revised pay journal, I mentioned that only direct loans are eligible to be repaid using the repay plan. And if you have non-direct federal student loans, such as a Perkins loan, or a Stafford, Grad Plus, or Consolidation loan, then you might have borrowed through a commercial lender through the FFEL, or Federal Family Education Loan Program, sometime prior to July 1st of 2010, then you would need to consolidate or refinance those loans into a direct consolidation loan to make that portion of your debt eligible for the revised pay or repay payment plan. So let's talk about briefly what is consolidation. Well, consolidation is a refinancing option. It is not the combining of loans as the word would imply. With consolidation, you are borrowing a new federal loan. It's called the Federal Direct Consolidation Loan. But only federal student loans are eligible to be consolidated. So if you have some private student loans, unfortunately, federal law does not currently allow you to also refinance those into the consolidation program. But all of your existing federal loans would be eligible. So that would be your Perkins loans, 
It could be any of your Stafford, Grad Plus, or consolidation loans you might have borrowed prior to July 1st of 2010 that were borrowed from a commercial lender, a bank, a credit union, something like that, through what was referred to as the FFEL program. And if you're not sure if you have those types of loans, then you'll want to check out the NSLDS or National Student Loan Data Site website at nslds.edia.gov. If you log into your financial aid review at that site, it'll give you a historical transcript of all the federal student loans you have. And if when you look at that listing of loans, any of the loans start with a word other than the word direct. If it doesn't start with the word direct, then it's not a direct loan, and that would be a loan that would not currently be eligible to be repaid using the repaid plan, and so you'd need to consolidate that loan into the direct consolidation loan in order to make it eligible. And for more information on how to take stock of your loan portfolio, to find out specifically what type of loan you have, you may want to check out one of the other modules that have been created for you as part of the Loan Repayment Strategy Series that's entitled Taking Stock of Your Loan Portfolio. Now, you don't want to consolidate loans you don't need to. So, for example, if you already have direct loans, they're already eligible for repay, and you're already going to end up with a consolidated monthly bill on those loans because they're all with a single lender and a single servicer. And this consolidation process, this refinancing, does slightly increase the interest cost of the debt. So you don't want to refinance or consolidate loans you don't need to because the interest rate on the new consolidation loan, the loan that results because you've used it to pay off or refinance uh, any of your existing loans, the interest rate on that new loan will be fixed and it will be equal to the weighted average of the interest rates of the loans you're consolidating, but then that weighted average will get rounded up to the nearest eighth of a percent. And because of that rounding up, it's going to slightly increase the interest expense. And it's only increasing a little bit, so it's probably worthwhile to do it in order to get, take advantage of this more flexible repayment option, because in having a more reflect, flexible repayment option, you're essentially lowering the opportunity cost of the debt, because you're freeing up potentially more of your resources to use any way you want. And you apply for the consolidation loan at studentloans.gov. And you can apply for, to reconsolidate any loans that you want to refinance once those loans are in their grace period, in repayment, deferment, or forbearance. So you'd at least have to wait until you're out of school. And if any of the loans you're applying to consolidate are currently in their grace period, the application allows you to request that the processing of your application be delayed until at least near the end of the grace period. So you can take advantage of it. And if the only loans you want to consolidate are Perkins loans, you will have to at least include uh, one direct loan because the government does have that requirement. For more information about consolidation, check out studentloans.gov and look up consolidation and they can tell you more about that. Now, what if you have loans that are currently on a payment plan and you want to switch those loans to repay? Well, you can. All you need to do is complete the income driven repayment plan request that's available out at studentloans.gov. And in that request, it'll ask you for the reason you're submitting the request. And there are four reasons. The fourth reason is, I'm already on an income-driven repayment plan, but I want to change to a different income-driven plan. And you'll want to select that option and then follow the instructions on how to complete the rest of that form. If you have questions about that, the best source for information about changing plans will be your loan servicer, the company that's actually managing the loans for your lender. So just give them a call. Tell them that you have loans that are currently on a different payment plan and you're interested in switching them to this new revised pay as earn or repay plan, and they'll give you instructions on how to do so. They'll also potentially talk about the, the pros and cons of doing that. And so you certainly want to you know, have that information. You also can get more information online from the Department of Education. General information about student loans is available at studentaid.gov. For more detailed information about repayment, particularly to get estimates of what your monthly payments might be under the new repay plan, you can use the repayment estimator that's available at studentloans.gov. If you need to consolidate any portion of your loans, the application for consolidation is at studentloans.gov, and you can get more information about the consolidation process at that site. And finally, for more information about the income-driven plans and to apply to put any of your loans on those plans, including this new revised pay as your plan or repay, again, that's available at studentloans.gov. But you also have the opportunity to learn more by checking out the other loan repayment modules. And in particular, I'd encourage you to check out the modules on the payment plans, 
the one that's specific to revised page room, the module on how to take stock of your loan portfolio, if you're not sure if you have any non-direct loans that you would need to consolidate, and also to check out the module on how to estimate or calculate your monthly payments using the repayment estimator. All of those modules are available to you and provide you with added information so that you can make a more informed decision about whether or not it makes sense for you to utilize Repay, the revised page room plan. This plan offers all direct student loan borrowers and the opportunity to use a 10% income-driven repayment option. And that can provide you with more flexibility in repaying your student loans. And you want to make sure that as you're approaching and repaying your student loans, that you're maximizing the flexibility that's inherent in federal student loans, so that you're not only successful in repaying your federal student loans, but you're also more quickly able to achieve the other personal, professional, and financial goals that are important to you. And repay is just one mechanism by which you can add to that flexibility. With that, I hope this information has been helpful to you. Good luck to you as you plan for and manage the repayment of your federal student loans.